I'm back with investigative writer Julie Kelly. We're talking about January 6th, and we're talking, Julie, about the Oath Keepers. Now, what's what's remarkable is this is supposed to be the most terrifying of all the insurrectionist groups. That let, yet, as you say, what they did was march in the Capitol. They were there for about 20 minutes, and they took photos and left. Um, so this gives you an idea of the mismatch between the rhetoric and, and the reality. But there's one real anomaly, and I know that the guys at Revolver News have been all over this. It's the anomaly that the Oath Keepers has a leader. He recruited many of these guys into this. He brought them to D.C. He was organizing their efforts. I don't. I believe he didn't go in the Capitol, but he was constantly monitoring people as they did go in the Capitol. And this man has not been arrested. He has not been charged. And I think Revolver News' implication is that this guy is probably an FBI guy or an FBI informant who had been deposited or who had essentially been used within the Oath Keepers to bust all these other guys. Talk a little bit about about Stuart Rhodes uh, and about his role in this whole matter. Yes, and I'm glad that you gave credit to Darren Beatty at Revolver News. He's really the one who was digging into this and raised the first questions about why Stuart Rhodes, who is the head of the Oath Keepers, who is in who is person one in every single conspiracy. I think we're now at the sixth superseding indictment in the Oath Keepers case. Yet here he is, more than nine months later, walking around a free man. Um, and the question is why, if there was a conspiracy to attack the Capitol, Stuart Rhodes was central to that. Um, and then the New York Times um, sort of came in to clean up like they love to do and said, oh, Stuart Rhodes submitted to an FBI interview in May and turned over his cell phone. And then they gave his cell phone back, you know, nothing that's happened to any of the other Oath Keepers. So why is he still not charged? We have the first trial dates have been set in the Oath Keeper case. We have three people who are in the DC jail. They've been there since last spring. Again, not charged with any violent crimes, but they're detained for some reason and Stuart Rhodes isn't. And so um, that's raising a lot of questions. And now we do know, thanks to the New York Times, there were at least two federal FBI informants who had infiltrated the Proud Boys and were on the ground with them that day communicating with FBI handlers. So the idea that there was no FBI informant, anyone involved in the Oath Keepers, it just it, it just defies uh, plausibility. Well, Julie, what seems to give this idea that the FBI was uh, not only had informants, but to some degree was involved in January 6th, but po- possibly was even the instigator, at least of some of what happened on January 6th, is, is given credibility by the fact that we see that MO, that, that modus operandi played out in the Governor Whitmer kidnapping case. Uh, talk for a bit about the parallels between the Governor Whitmer kidnap, kidnapping case and January 6th. So the court proceedings in that case um, are really revealing in terms of how it could could support the FBI's involvement in January 6th. You have now 13 people charged for crimes for the, I call it the kidnapping case, because of course the FBI is the one who came up with the kidnapping of Gretchen Whitmer, which coincidentally was was, uh, covered by the news. These arrests took place as early voting was going on in the key swing state of Michigan. They announced these arrests on October. October 8th, they blamed Donald Trump for it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But what happened is there was one FBI informant or agent for every person who was arrested. They have at least a dozen FBI informants and undercover agents who were involved in this plot, who did everything, Dinesh. They orchestrated it. They funded these surveillance trips. They set these guys up to buy explosives, and that's when they were arrested. So now that that case, the federal case, has a 90-day continuance given by the judge because the defense wants to investigate all of the FBI behavior. Now, I've written about some of it. People can read my articles at amgreatness.com about what's going on in that case. It is fascinating. Um, But the FBI started what's called Operation Cold Snap in the spring of 2020 to infiltrate these militia groups. It is, there is no way Um, that they just did that for the Whitmer plot and a few other plots that they were trying to come uh, pull together and not for January 6th. Just does not make any sense. I mean, one interesting tidbit right out of your article, Julie, is that the very guy who was directing the FBI operation in the Whitmer kidnapping bust uh, 
was then transferred to Washington, D.C., where he is now a key figure in the January 6th investigation. So this is not just a matter of seeing intellectual similarities between the two cases. The guy running this operation over here has been moved over here, and he's now directing the January 6th um, follow-up. Is, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, Stephen D'Antono, I believe is how you pronounce his name. He was head of the, D of the Detroit FBI office, field office, uh, who oversaw this operation. Uh, the arrests were made on October 8th. On October 13th, he's promoted to the DC field office. Now, why was he moved around? There's no such thing as coincidences in Chris Ray's FBI. And so um, there was a reason why he got that plum assignment and why he was out of the box talking about what the FBI was going to do to all these people, rounding them up across the country uh, because of what happened on January 6th. So there are no coincidences. We're going to find out a lot more about FBI, FBI's central involvement in what happened on January 6th. I mean, Julie, I think in retrospect, when you look at these, I think back now to, to Governor Whitmer's press conference, where she sounded totally shocked that there was an effort to kidnap her. She sounded totally shocked that these groups were doing this. Uh, and as you say, she pointed the finger at Trump. But knowing what we know now, she already knew about the plot. She had already been tipped off about it. So all of this was a kind of, of theater or drama that she put on to create, as you say, a public narrative she was in the know. She knew all along that she was never in any real danger, didn't she? She absolutely did know all along. And she did give this dramatic press conference. Joe Biden came out with a statement uh, condemning Trump for the alleged kidnapping plot. Um, Democrats were all over that, as you recall. So think of those, those headlines that were created, not just in Michigan as voting was going on, but across the country and blaming Trump for these evil militia men who are trying to kidnap one of the plots, Dinesh, the FBI tried to orchestrate at the same time was a plot to assassinate the Virginia governor, Ralph Northam. I guess they couldn't pull that off before the election too. But there's clear evidence that the FBI tried to put that together too. Um, and so there is just such a corrupt and moral rot at this FBI. Also interestingly, Dinesh, Cash Patel says the only person they could not get a hold of on January 5th and January 6th from the Joint Chiefs to the Defense Secretary down the line, the only person they could not reach was Christopher Ray. Why is that? What was Christopher Ray doing on January 5th and 6th? Uh, it would be nice if somebody asked him that question during one of his congressional hearings. When we come back, I'm going to wrap it up with Julie Kelly. We're going to talk not just about the um, significance of January 6th, but what you can do to help some of these defendants and also some of these families that are in dire straits. <laughs> 